Hey everybody, so in this video, I'm gonna go over the general senses. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the anatomy of some of the general senses and some physiological activities that you could do to test these general senses. All right, but first, um, let's just clarify the difference between general senses versus special senses. Uh, general senses you find throughout your body and they could be used for a lot of different things, detecting the external environment or help regulate parts of the body. While special senses, we're really talking about uh, senses where you need a specialized organ in order to detect the stimulus. So special senses include your eyes, ears, your equilibrium, stuff like that. So today we're just focusing on the general senses. And specifically, I'm going to focus on the exteroreceptors that really detect external stimuli with the general senses. And most of these are close to the body surface. All right, so we're going to take this skin cut out to kind of point out some of these uh, receptors that you will need to identify or that you can identify. And as I go through this, I want you to kind of look at where you find these receptors because it really helps make sense of what they do. Okay, so the first one I'm going to point out is the tactile corpuscle or Meisner corpuscle. If you see corpuscle in the name, it really indicates that it's encapsulated. With the tactile corpuscles, these are really more responsible for light touch. You're really going to find the tactile corpuscles in the papillae of the skin. And by papillae, I mean these little projections that stick up from the dermal layer into the epidermal layer. And again, they're used for light touch and pressure. So they're really close, or they're very superficial compared to a lot of these other receptors, which makes sense to what their function is. Next is the bulbous corpuscle or raffini corpuscle and these are responsible for deep continuous pressure and uh, these are slow to adapt and I'll explain what adaptation is later on in this video. And next we have the lamellar corpuscle or pacinian corpuscle and these are for deep pressure again but these are much quicker to adapt. Then we have hair follicle receptors, um, which are receptors that are around each hair follicle, and this really can detect hair movement and light touch. And this is really easy to test if you just brush your hand very gently over any of the hair on your body. You can feel that kind of tickling sensation, and that's really because of these receptors. And then we have free nerve endings, and free nerve endings are more responsible for pain and detecting temperatures. So there's different types of free nerve endings. Um, with temperature, a lot of those can adapt pretty quickly, but receptors like the pain receptors or the pain-free nerve endings, they don't really adapt that quickly, which really makes sense to their function. You kind of want to know if you're experiencing pain to, um, and if there's any tissue damage so you can remove yourself from that situation. And with the free nerve endings, you're going to find them throughout the body, not just in the dermal layer here. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about some of the physiological activities you could do to test a lot of these general senses. We're gonna start with two-point discrimination. All right, so before we get into this, I did wanna talk a little bit about receptive fields because that's really a big part on how your body's able to detect a stimulus. And if you might remember from the previous video, we talked about how sensory neurons are the ones coming in towards your spinal cord really to bring in information into your body. And every sensory neuron can be fed by multiple receptors. And all the receptors collectively, the space that they occupy is what your receptive field is. So I have this quick animation to describe that. Okay, so let's say we take this section of skin here. And in the skin, you're going to find multiple receptors and all these receptors can feed in to one sensory neuron. This area that the receptors occupy, this is referred to as your receptive field. So this is the part of the skin this one sensory neuron can detect. Now, a lot of the sensitivity you have to stimuli comes from the density of these receptive fields. And by density, I mean how many receptors per unit area in the skin. So let's say we have this same dimension of skin, but in this receptive field, we have this many receptors. So now we have a higher concentration or a higher density of receptors in this area 
meaning this area is probably going to be more sensitive. All right, so how can we figure out which parts of the body have receptive fields that have higher density of receptors? Well, one way to map this is to use the two-point discrimination test. All right, so how this works is that we take a subject. So let's say this is our subject right here. And then we're going to take a caliper. And we're going to use the caliper to touch different parts of the body and to see the minimum distance it takes before the subject can distinguish two different points. So we would start with the caliper completely closed, touch the body, and then we would slowly open the caliper until the subject can distinguish or determine two different points. At this point, we are going to take a measurement and this will be considered our two-point threshold or the minimum distance it takes to distinguish two different points. So again, we would do this all over the body, and what we would find is that the areas of the body that have the smallest two-point threshold or the highest density of receptors is in the hands and face, and more specifically in the fingertips and in the lips. All right, so next we're going to look at tactile localization, and this test really is measuring the size or the area of the receptive fields. All right, so let's take a look at this animation depicting what's going on here with the size of the receptive fields. So let's say we have these two pieces of skin that are roughly the same area. And one, we have large receptive fields, and it's going to be innervated by two neurons, while the other one, we have four receptive fields that are innervated by four neurons. And we're going to touch the same distance in both these pieces of skin. So on the left-hand side here, when we touch one side of this distance that we measured, you're going to see an action potential run from the receptor down the, to the sensory neuron. And then when we touch the other side, we're going to have an action potential that's stimulated. And then it's going to run to that same neuron. So it doesn't matter what side we touch. The same neuron is detecting this stimulus. So we can't really distinguish one side from another. Versus when we have a smaller receptive field and we measure the same distance. First we touch one side. And then you see an action potential run down one sensory neuron. And then we touch the other side, and we see that the action potential is now going to be stimulated in another neuron. Here, since we have smaller receptive fields, we're able to distinguish the distance better. All right, so going back to tactile localization, how this test is done is that we take our subject, and then we blindfold them. And then the tester is going to take a marker of a specific color and touch different parts of the body. And then we ask the subject to try to match with a different color marker where we touched them. And then we measure the distance of error that the subject made. And then if we did this all over the body, what we'd see is, again, the smallest amount of error is going to be in the hands and fingertips. All right, so next we're going to talk about adaptation. Um, so let's, again, look at this animation of a section of skin. And we have this receptive field that is feeding into one sensory neuron. And then let's add a stimulus and just leave the stimulus there. So some receptors are able to adapt to a stimulus, meaning if the stimulus is prolonged, then we're going to start seeing slower and slower releases of action potential and until it eventually stops. Now, not all receptors do this. Only certain ones do. Uh, but a good example of this is Think about wearing your clothes. I mean, when you first put your clothes on in the morning, you're going to feel them. You feel the weight of them on your body. But as you go out through the day, you start to lose the sensation of your clothes on your body. Adaptation doesn't just happen in touch receptors, though. It could also happen in temperature receptors. So this is really easy to test. So we could take, let's say, a bowl of hot water. And let's go ahead and put one hand in that hot water for a few minutes. After that few minutes is up, then we can go ahead and add our second hand to the water as well and then compare the feeling or the sensation we have in both hands. What you're going to feel is the hand that's been in the water for a while is going to be desensitized to the temperature. It's going to adapt to that temperature and not feel as hot as the hand that we just added. So we have two types of thermoreceptors throughout the body. We have hot and we have cold and both are able to undergo adaptation 
and we could test this by putting both our hands in two different temperature waters. So let's say we put one hand in hot water, another hand in cold water, and leave it there for a little while. Those sense or receptors will adapt to that temperature. And then if we take both those hands and then stick them in lukewarm water after they've been adapted, what we're going to find is that the hand that was originally in hot water, when we put it in lukewarm water, it's going to feel cold because all the hot receptors have been adapted. So now only the cold receptors are communicating with the brain versus the cold hand that had the cold receptors adapt. It's going to feel hot in the lukewarm water for the same reason. The cold receptors have been adapted while the hot receptors uh, can be activated and stimulated to send signals to the brain. And we have a term for this phenomenon. We call it negative after imaging. All right, next we're going to look at the phenomenon of referred pain. And referred pain is when you feel pain in different areas of body than what is actually being stimulated. So an easy way to test this is to take a bowl of ice water and go ahead and put your elbow in it. And at first you're probably going to feel the pain in your elbow. But as you leave your elbow in the ice water, the pain is slowly going to crawl up your ulnar nerve until it reaches your hand. And so after a while, you're not going to feel the pain in the elbow anymore. You're going to feel the pain in the hand. And then if you removed your elbow from the stimulus, as your arm warms up, that pain is going to slowly crawl back down your ulnar nerve until it reaches your elbow again and then finally disappears.